to this fourth uh, day of the computational uh, phase transitions workshop. Uh, we have an amazing program also today, and uh, we will start with uh, Samantha Petty from Harvard, who will uh, tell us about uh, hard spheres or hard disks. And uh, please. Thanks for the introduction. Um, can you all see my screen? Okay. Um, today I'll be talking about correlation decay for hard spheres via Markov chains. Um, and what I'll be talking about today is joint work with Tyler Helmuth and Will Perkins. And the paper corresponding to it is here on the archive with the same name as the talk. So I'll start by talking about the hard sphere model and then discuss what it means if this model were to have a phase transition. Um, then I'll talk about sampling from this model with Markov chains. And I'll talk about our results, compare them to previous results and talk about why phase transitions and Markov chains are related in this context. And I'll end with a proof outline um, showing why the Markov chain we're gonna consider is fast mixing um, in certain ranges. So I'll start with the hard sphere model or even one step back, what's a sphere packing? So we say a sphere packing of a set lambda is a set of mutually non-overlapping spheres contained in the set. So here our spheres are in two dimension, they're disks, and this is a packing because none of these two disks overlap. So it's fine if you want to think about the entire talk in two dimensions, but everything we do is going to be in D dimensions. Um, why are sphere packings of interest? Well, there's many reasons. Um, here are just a few. So the one that sort of got me hooked in the sphere world um, is that sphere packings are so easy to define yet so poorly understood. Like we can easily explain what it means with spheres in space in two dimensions, three dimensions, and high dimensions. But despite how easy it is to define the model, we don't know much about it in the sense of we don't know what dense packings look like in high dimensions. And we don't even know what the um, correct density is asymptotically for how dense we can pack spheres. Um, sphere packings are also uh, of interest to coding theory if you're sending signals um, and you want to uh, make sure all the possible messages you could be sending are far apart so that if they get some noise, they don't intersect, you'd want to use a sphere packing for that. Um, and a historical note is the hard sphere model was one of the first um, things people try to simulate with um, Markov chain Monte Carlo. So today I'll be focusing on the hard sphere model. Um, the hard sphere model is a probability distribution over sphere packings um, defined with the following properties and parameters. So the parameters are capital lambda, which is the space that we have our sphere packing in. So here it's a box and the fugacity parameter. Um, so all of our spheres must lie entirely in the box. We have the property that all sphere packings with the same number of spheres are equally likely. And we have the the fugacity parameter lambda controls how packed we want a typical configuration. So a higher fugacity favors packings with more spheres. Um, but formally, the hard sphere model is a, a probability measure mu on the set lambda with fugacity parameter lambda. And it's defined by conditioning a Poisson point process of intensity lambda on the set and we're conditioning this on the events that the points are at least pairwise distance to R. So that means that our spheres aren't overlapping and they need to be at least distance R from the boundaries. So they're contained in the set. Um, wait, any questions about the model? Okay, now I'll talk at, at, like in the high level about um, the concept of decay of correlations, in particular, how we can think about it with reference to the hard sphere model. So we'd say that the hard sphere model exhibits decay of correlations if fixing a sphere in some area here. So say we fix this sphere here, hardly affects the probability that there's a sphere at a distant point y. So as an example, this isn't the hard sphere model, oops. Um, but imagine we had some distribution over sphere packings that looks really random and we had a different distribution where you pick this sphere packing with probability half and this sphere packing with probability half. We'd say that there's no decay of correlations over here because if there's a sphere here, you know you must be in this packing, you know there's a sphere over here. 
if there's not a sphere here, you know you're in this packing and there's not a sphere here. So it's no decay of correlations. Whereas on this side, we have decay of correlations because if I tell you there's a sphere in this corner, it doesn't really tell you whether or not there's gonna be a sphere up in the other corner. And likewise, if I tell you there's not a sphere, you don't really know. So at a high level, that's what you should think about. Decay of correlations means one point way over here doesn't really tell you about what's happening far away. So the conjecture, we can frame the conjectured phase transition for the hard sphere model in terms of this. So the conjecture is that there's a disordered phase. So um, in this phase, when you sample from the model, everything kind of looks spread out and random. You'd have this decay of correlations. And then if there's a phase transition, as we increase that fugacity parameter lambda and our model starts to favor sphere packings with more and more spheres, uh, all of a sudden we'd have a point where now we have a crystalline phase and there'd be no decay of correlations in this phase. Um, another way of formulating this is the disorder phase is the unique infinite volumes Gibbs measure and the crystalline phase would be the non unique infinite volume Gibbs measure. So it's an open question whether or not there is a phase transition in the hard sphere model and arbitrary dimensions. So what this would mean is that this critical value is less than infinity, that there's some point where we have disordered and crystalline. If there is no phase transition, we would just say this critical point equals infinity. It's known that there's a critical point in uh, one dimension. It's conjectured by physicists that there's a, uh, or, or sorry, one dimension, um, no phase transition, conjectured by physicists in two dimensions that um, there also is no phase transition and in three dimensions and above or actually I'm not sure about it, in three dimensions conjecture that there is a phase transition. So um, even though there's conjectures, the jury is still somewhat out on, on these things. Um, we'll also talk today a little bit about the critical density, which is the expected density of a packing drawn from the hard sphere model um, at the critical fugacity. Can so I have also, a oh, yes. question too? If you go back two slides or one slide. So here? here you're saying there is no phase transition. The conjecture is that there is no phase transition in two dimensions, but these two pictures look very different to me. So uh, what, can you explain a little bit more why? Um, so it just hasn't been proven that there is or is not. Um, some people have some intuition that there might be a phase transition, but I think people don't know. Okay. Um, if you're going to define formally what it means to be a phase transition? Um, in, we, I, I'm not going to cover it specifically. In, I didn't have it specifically on a si slide, but it's um, the unique or non-unique infinite volume gives measures how we've treated it in the paper. Um, For what it's worth, I think that the physicists believe that there is a phase transition in two dimensions, but that it's of a somewhat different kind, but I don't want to take any more of your time. Yeah, there's something with the um, angles happening there. Yeah, I, I, I'll, I'll save that if we have time at the end. I don't know too much about that. Okay. So our goal is to drive improved lower bounds on the critical fugacity and the critical density by analyzing Markov chains. Okay, so this audience, I don't really need to talk about what a Markov chain is, um, but we want to come up with a Markov chain that's rapidly mixing. So if you take a lot of samples from it, um, if we look at like the teeth sample, it's gonna look like it was drawn from the hard sphere model or something close to it. And we want that to happen for T that's polynomial in the size of the input. So the, or, or, sorry, the Markov chain we analyze here for the hard sphere model is single center dynamics. So we can define them as follows. So the first step um, is to choose a point X uniformly at random from our set. So say I've chosen this set or this point X. Now we'll flip a coin that's weighted and with probability lambda over one plus lambda, we'll add a center at the point X. And only if X is not within distance to R of another center or it's not about to come out of the bounding box lambda. So if our coin flip told us to try to add and this is our point X, we would have added a sphere here. With the other um, side of the coin with probability one over one plus lambda, we're going to remove any centers that are within R of point X. So here there's no other centers, so we wouldn't have done anything. 
if our point X had instead been this point and our coin flip told us to try to add a center, we wouldn't because we can't add a center here. And if it, our coin flip told us to remove a center, we would have removed this center here, yielding one uh, a sphere packing with one less sphere. And it's not too hard to show that the stationary distribution of the Markov chain is indeed the hard sphere model. Okay, so wait, any questions on the dynamics? Okay, now I'll talk about a little bit about our results and uh, compare them to previous results. So our, our main theorem is that the single center dynamics for the hard sphere model are rapidly mixing um, for fugacity parameters strictly less than two to the minus d plus one. And we can use this result to achieve the best known lower bounds on the critical fugacity and the critical density. So our critical fugacity lower bound is two to the minus d plus one and our critical density lower bound is two thirds to the minus D or uh, about 0.85 plus a little of a term to the minus D. So our results don't tell us about whether or not there is a phase transition, but they do say if there is a phase transition, it occurs above these um, fugacity parameters. Um, so I'm going to focus mostly in this talk on how we prove this theorem, but I want to uh, quickly describe how we go from this theorem to these um, new lower bounds. So for this, uh, we're gonna draw the connection between Markov chains and phase transitions. So if a Markov chain is rapidly mixing, we can think of that as being after enough steps, a sample from the Markov chain looks like it came from the desired stationary distribution. Um, and this implies a property called optimal temporal mixing. Optimal temporal mixing, you can think of as being after enough steps, the total variation distance between two instances of a Markov chain is small. So this makes sense if your Markov chain is always going to go towards the hard sphere model distribution and you start two Markov chains and they're both going towards the hard sphere model, of course, they're going to be going towards each other. Um, then we show that optimal temporal mixing implies strong spatial mixing for the hard sphere model and single center dynamics. So strong spatial mixing is saying that if you have a, a set, a subset within the place you're sphere packing, we'll call that lambda prime, and lambda prime is far from the boundary of lambda. Um, it's saying that if you fix spheres on the boundary, whatever's happening on the boundary of lambda hardly influences the hard sphere model restricted to the smaller set lambda prime. So this is like a decay of correlations. So we show this property and strong spatial mixing implies the uniqueness of the infinite volume limit, which is how we're defining in this context that the phase transition has not yet happened. So following this chain of logic, if the single center dynamics for the Markov chain is rapidly mixing for lambda less than two to the um, minus d plus one, then the critical value is also above this point. Can I ask okay. a question? Yeah. Uh, on the previous slide, I thought uh, this was, a diff if I'm uh, on the strong spatial mixing, no. Oh. no. There we go. I thought the strong. This is the definition of this spatial mixing, and strong spatial mixing means also that you condition on some other sides close to the boundary or not close to the boundary to have a particular occupancy uh, pattern. Uh, so uh, this is just saying that the boundary doesn't influence what's in, in, in deep inside, and strong spatial mixing means also that it it happens when, in addition, some other sides are fixed to a particular. Am I? Um, so what I mean here by boundary conditions is that, um, I tried to highlight it, it didn't work. Um, boundary conditions is that, so we're saying lambda is the boundary and then we've said, okay, like this sphere is living close to the boundary and it's stuck and we're conditioning our probability distribution that like these specific spheres on the boundary. So I think I'm talking about the same thing but it maybe wasn't clear from the way I said it. Maybe, I mean, I can maybe answer David's question which is, yeah. Lambda prime can be any set. And so what happens with uh, spheres in the hard sphere model, you cut away volume. And so it actually is the same. Uh, but in the strong spatial mixing, it doesn't need to be far from the boundary. This set that you fix, it could be close to the boundary outside. Yeah, yeah, but this lambda prime can be any set. It doesn't have to be a box. And so that accounts for uh, spheres placed uh, anywhere inside the big box. Okay, that's, okay. that's good enough. Thank you.
Okay. Um, oh, sorry, this slide. So um, these are the best known lower bounds. So in 2007, the cluster expansion approach uh, gave a lower bound of um, one over e to the minus d. And then uh, more recently, Poisson balloon percolation gave a lower bound of one uh, plus a little one term to the minus d. And we improve on this um, by a factor of two and remove the asymptotic part to the minus d plus one um, using our Markov chain in this equivalence. So, um, have, oh, go ahead. I have a question. So does, does your method imply exponential decay of correlation? So the correlation decays like e to the minus the distance from, from the you know, boundary or, or? I believe it's e to the minus distance from the boundary. Well, you can correct me if I'm misremembering. Yeah, that's right, exponential decay. Because this is related to what Chris mentioned before. In two dimension, I think the conjecture is that there is a phase transition between exponential and polynomial decay. I mean, okay. it's not a phase transition in the sense of non-uniqueness of Gibbs measure, but it's a phase transition. I, I agree. So in that sense, you will, you will lower bound that phase transition. Uh, okay. Yeah, there should be an asterisk on the phase transition. I'm, the, I'm talking about just the phase transition with the uh, infinite volume gives measure. Um, in two dimensions, a little bit more has been done in the specific other cases. Um, and our bound also is the best known lower bound for two dimensions, which is now a half. Um, so I also like to compare um, our Markov chain to other ways of sampling from the hard sphere model and sphere like models. So I'll first talk a little bit about the canonical sphere model. So this is a different model than the hard sphere model um, because you have a fixed number of spheres. So it's like conditioning the hard sphere model on the number of spheres. So it's saying uniformly over all sphere packets with case spheres, let's pick one. Um, and that has been uh, studied recently. So Kanan, Mahoney and Montenegro in 2003 uh, showed that a single particle global move Markov chain is fast mixing for densities below two to the minus D minus one. And then more recently um, in two dimensions, um, he's more improved this, um, improved the analysis of this Markov chain and showed that um, it's rapidly mixing for densities below 0 0.154. So to put this in context, um, Earlier, I said our results in terms of the fugacity where it's fast mixing, but that corresponds to density below two thirds to the two thirds times two to the minus d, um, which is about or and and this other bound um, which comes out to be less than a six for two dimensions. Um, the hard sphere model itself has also been sampling from the hard sphere model itself uh, has also been studying studied. So going back to the fugacity parameter, the um, previous previous work showed that partial rejection sampling is efficient for lambda less than 0 0.23 in two dimensions. And so uh, our uh, bound of a half is, uh, improves that. Okay, so for the last part of the talk, I'll talk through um, how we showed that this particular single center and dynamics Markov chain is fast mixing. So here's the theorem from before, fast mixing for lambda less than two to the minus d plus one. Um, so our proof outline, we follow um, Bubli and Dyer's path coupling approach. So we define a metric D between pairs of configurations. And then we show that for any pair of configurations that differ by one sphere, there's a coupling of the Markov chain so that the expected change in this distance is negative. So um, the key idea for this approach is extending the state space. And this is an idea um, we got from Vigoda's 2001 work on the mixing time of Glauber dynamics on the hardcore model on bounded degree graphs. So for those who might not be familiar, the um, hardcore model is sampling independent sets on graphs. So it's a very similar flavor to sphere packings because you're trying to sample things that are mutually far apart. Um, so he found that by extending his state space instead of uh, looking at a Markov chain over independent sets. He looked at a Markov chain over um, sets of vertices. Um, by doing so, he was able to show that um, Glauber dynamics um, has a mixing time of order n log n for a particular value of lambda as a function of the degree of the graph. So we do a similar thing. We change the state space from sets of packings 
to sets of centers. Um, we don't do all sets of centers. We're interested in sets of centers such that each point of our set is covered by at most two spheres. So here, okay, I've changed my lamb, my set lambda before usually was a box, now it's a circle. And this is an example, clearly not of a sphere packing because my two spheres are overlapping, but it is an example of a configuration in our extended state space um, because it's uh, each point in our set is only covered by zero, one or two spheres. And we can say that an mix, the mixing time of our Markov chain on this state space, this extended state space is an upper bound on the mixing time of um, the Markov chain on the space we actually care about. And since if we start in the space we care about, if we start with a packing, the single center dynamics will always keep us in a packing. Um, we can use this as an upper bound. So with the path coupling approach, we need to define a pre-metric so our pre-metric is going to be defined on pairs of configurations that differ by one sphere. So here we have X and then we have X with like an extra sphere. So that sphere is V and we're going to define what, it, what the distance between this uh, configuration and this configuration is. Um, for this, we need a notion of block volume. Um, intuitively block volume is uh, points in the configuration where you cannot add centers. So here the block volume is everything in blue. So all blue points, you couldn't add a center there because you'd be either um, going outside the boundary or overlapping with another sphere. Um, and then we need the notion of an occupied neighborhood. So we say an occupied neighborhood of a vertex V with respect to the rest of the packing X is going to be how much of its two neighborhood is block volume, which is the intersection. Um, Okay, the, the, the size of the intersection, I'm missing the cardinality bars there. Okay, so, um, or no, I guess the cardinality bars are over here, sorry. So the distance between these two packings is going to be two to the D minus a constant that we choose wisely um, times the volume of this occupied neighborhood. Um, and then the algebra works out when we use this, this value of C. So I wanna give a little bit of intuition for why we need this extended state space um, for our analysis to work out. So we have defined um, our pre-metric on pairs of configurations in our extended state space that differ by one sphere. And D is going to be the corresponding shortest path metric on um, the state space, the extended state space. So I wanna show you why if we let D be the corresponding shortest path metric and we're allowed to use our extended state space, that actually gives us a different distances than if we have to use the um, smaller state space of packings. So here I'm back to circles being what we're putting our sphere packing in. And so here's two different sphere packings. Um, and if I want to define the distance between them, um, I could use the uh, triangle inequality and I'm going to use the um, distance to this particular configuration with the overlap. So the distance here um, is the sum of these two terms, the path of length two, you're going from this sphere packing to this one and then from this one to this one. And um, based on our metric from before, it's two to the D um, minus the occupied uh, volume, and so it's going to be strictly less than two to the d plus one, because we have two two terms that are less than two to the d. Um, now we could let the state space, or now we can do a thought experiment, like what if we didn't extend our state space? Now if we wanted to find the distance between these two um, configurations, the only possible way to do that um, in our graph of all the states is to go down to the state with no um, spheres. And now this distance according to our pre-metric is going to be two to the D as well as this one. So if our state space is different, we actually have different um, uh, metrics D. Okay, so that was a reminder. Okay, so the Markov chain um, is going to reduce expected distance in each iteration. So if you have a configuration X and then a configuration Y where Y just has one more sphere than X, and now we're going to couple one move in the Markov chain in each of these configurations. And we'll yeah, measure. Uh, oh, yeah. A, a quick question. Mm -hmm. So um, maybe maybe this was already clear, but so does the distance between two states go to zero as the distance between 
the two the two spheres centers go, goes to zero. So I like to think about comparing um, a configuration, two configurations where one has an extra sphere as opposed to the other. But I think what you would do for the in-between would be having an overlapping sphere. I, I need to think more about that. Um, I can think more about that and get, and get back to you. Um, okay, just to finish. Um, so we're looking at the expected distance and how it changes once we apply one step of the Markov chain. Um, and so the analysis that we need to do is some casework. So we need to consider we have X or, or one configuration has spheres X and another has X plus an extra sphere. And so when that extra sphere is removed, everything's great, everything's coupled and that decreases the distance. Um, we could have the case where a center is added to the configuration X, but not added to the configuration Y because it's blocked by that center V. And now we have to use a triangle inequality to estimate um, this distance here. And then we could have the situation where a center is added to both X and Y or a center is removed from both X and Y. And in those cases, we have to analyze how those um, occupied volume changes um, to see how the distance changes. But um, we worked out that this is a um, upper bound on the change in distance and it's going to be less than zero specifically in the range of lambda that we want. Okay, um, sorry for going a little over. Thanks everyone. Um, any questions? Any questions? I, I have a question. So um, thanks for the great talk. I think this is lovely work. Um, so one question that you've probably anticipated is that for independent sets on graphs, there's this, it almost feels like a duality between uh, studying very simple Markov chains with a fancier metric and studying slightly fancier Markov chains that have more moves. And so it seems like the analogous move here is a slide move where I'm allowed to take a, a, a disk and shift it slightly. And so I mean, is there an analogous thing here to the case of independent sets on graphs where we can argue that if I do those slide moves at a certain rate, or maybe the rate depends on the distance I'm sliding it, um, or the the symmetric, uh, the size of the symmetric difference in the neighborhoods before and after, that that would also mix quickly up to the same point? Uh, I haven't thought too much into that, but that seems like a very interesting direction to go in. So I have a question for perhaps. Um, what is known about upper bounds? Say that again? What is known about upper bounds on lambda C? Oh, um, well, if we had an upper bound, we would know that there exists a phase transition. So I think nothing other than oh, really? that it doesn't okay. exist in one dimension. That's it. <laughs> And what is what is the difficulty there? Uh, normally, lower bounds on mixing times are easier than upper bounds. Sometimes, I haven't thought too much about the upper bound problem. I don't have as much intuition there. I mean, isn't there something like a Peyer's argument? I mean, normally in the models on grids, there is Peyer's argument. There's infinitely many ground states here. Right. Yeah, I understand that. So the the piles argument doesn't work. It's a it's a great open problem, but that right. doesn't. But that doesn't mean. I mean, uh, you can do Peyer's argument for uh, models with continuous spins, right? In, in, uh, Only like Whittem Rollinson, which is a different type of phase transition. Uh, cannot you do ON model in in three dimension? Cannot you prove existence of a phase transition with Peyer's argument? Oh, I see. You mean on a lattice? On a lattice. On a lattice. Yeah. I don't, I don't know. Okay. Other questions? Okay, I'll ask one more question. Is okay. there any heuristic estimate of what is lambda C? Um, how far you are from the real right lambda C? 
I mean, physicists must have, I mean, have, I know, have simulated this to death, right? So. Yeah, I, I'm not sure. I'll see if anyone in the audience knows. Um, I, I will say that in our analysis, there were sort of like a lot of like worst case thing, upper bound type things that it's like, this isn't going to be generally when you're moving a sphere or something, this drastic isn't happening. So it definitely doesn't feel like it's the tight um, lower bound. Um, but if anyone knows any more, please chime in. I mean, uh, the, all the all the bounds that I saw in your uh, review were two to the minus d times a constant, right? So I wonder whether at least the two minus two to the minus d factor is correct or not. Uh, according to the cavity method, that is correct. So Francesco Zamponi um, applies cavity method to hard spheres and high dimensions, and this two to the minus d is correct. Okay. So um, the the first phase transition should happen at I think some. Uh, d times two to the minus d or something like that, but the two to the minus d has to be there. Yeah. Nice. I I just wanted to mention the the situation in two dimensions is you know maybe a very hard but still a really interesting open problem. So as Andrea referred to, there's a classic physics argument that says that we can't literally have a solid crystal in two dimensions. In other words, as you get farther away from the origin, there is some spatial jiggle so that very far away, the even if I condition on a disk at the origin, the probability distribution would get broader and broader as I go farther away. But there's this conjectured hexatic phase, which is quite mysterious, which says that if I condition on the angle between two nearby disks at the origin, that this information does survive at arbitrarily long distances. In other words, if you were to plot a histogram of the angles between nearby things, you would see six peaks as you go around the circle corresponding to a roughly close packing. And numerically, this does seem to persist. So it, it, in that sense, I guess you wouldn't have uniqueness of the Gibbs measure because you would have one Gibbs measure for each uh, rotation. Um, so, Anyway, but, but uh, I don't remember. I mean, is, does the angle really persist or it decays uh, polynomially, right? Because I remember there is the Mermin Wagner theorem that should say that you know the angle should go. Well, I, I, I need to look up the <laughs> latest, I, I need to look up the papers by Werner Kraut and company. Um, yeah. But I thought, I thought that that information could actually persist at long range, but I, I could be wrong. Oh, yeah. Okay. Stupid question. What is angle here? I mean, these are spheres. So I guess you're the alignment of the of the centers corresponding to the horizontal. Is that what you mean by angle? I, I just mean if if you so if you do a numerical experiment where you take, say, um, the let, let, let's put a disk at the origin and then you let everything else move around. And then you look at the angles of, say, the closest other disk to the origin. Okay, I see. Right. So if you were at fairly high densities, you would expect kind of roughly a triangular close packing. Yeah. And so if you just do this as a numerical experiment, and I, I know it's like how close is close enough, blah, 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 but you see these peaks at, I see. Uh, you know, at multiples of 60 degrees shifted somehow. I see. Yeah. So there is a related question in the QA box that asks. Uh, uh, how do this 2D phase transition relate to the cost of its tallest transition of 2D superfluid vortices? And I think it's similar in the sense that, I don't know, anybody knows more than me, but 2D superfluid vortices are like hardcore spheres. I mean, they cannot penetrate each other. Yeah. And so perhaps, I mean, you know, what I remember is that there is, yeah, you can see the angle and then this angle, according to Nelson theory of a, uh, constantly starless phase transition in the sense they start decaying uh, polynomially but not exponentially. But okay. I think we have five more minutes in the program. Uh, anybody else wants to ask something? A quick question uh, Is there some meaningful model for a three version of this model that would be a reasonable proxy for? Um, model in RD, just like uh, regular trees, a reasonable proxy for.
for is it me? reasonable to for some purposes of for some people. So this is what Will was referring to, right? I mean, uh, Francesco Zamponi has studied. I mean, the, it has not done exactly on a tree, but it has done it uh, on uh, on ZD on uh, ZD on on RD using uh, uh, large dimension limit, and there is some kind of mean field theory of this. And then there is another model that is uh, you can do hard spheres in in on a lattice, right? And then generalize this to a tree. There was a yeah, okay. There are a bunch of models. Uh, but hard are... spheres on the lattice is not the independent set on the lattice. It's something else. Uh, because independent set on the lattice behaves completely differently. You but... can set a radius, right? On the lattice. So you can have centers. Centers mm -hmm. are on the lattice. So David, I have one other answer to your question, which is a very new paper I have with Marcus Michelin. We do we construct some infinite tree-like object to do recursions. And so we can get a, a factor E. Uh, and so we can basically get the whites type bound for hard spheres, but also a bunch of repulsive point processes. Um, and, and there's some natural like tree object there uh -huh. that's very strange. It like is infinitely branching, um, but you can do the whites argument essentially and get another factor E. So it's E over two to the D. E over two to the D, right. Where D is some branching, some. E is the dimension, dimension. Oh, so this is done on the ladder, on what? Uh, G, yes, G for hard spheres or, or other repulsive point processes. But you, you, there's a recursion for the density of the process that is like the White's recursion and, it, and it's some weird tree object. So this is an analysis of the same model in RD, but in which, you know, yeah. in the analysis, you use a tree object. Comes yeah, but you could also do the point process on this weird tree object. I see. Okay, nice. Mm. Interesting. Uh, okay. Well, let's thank the speaker again. Ah, yeah, absolutely. <laughs> you all for listening. And uh, the next speaker is, uh, I guess, Will. Right?